Welcome back everybody. In today's tutorial, you are going to learn how to code a modular convolutional neural network in PyTorch. This is important because it allows you to build networks of arbitrary complexity, which helps you to keep up to date and advances in the field of computer vision. It has an added side effect of making your code look more professional and more succinct. And who wouldn't want that? Let's get started. So before we begin, full disclosure, I got the majority of this code from somebody else's blog uh, many months ago, and I have since lost a link to it. So I'm not claiming this as my own work. And if you recognize the code, if you're the author of this, please leave a comment down below so that I can link and give you appropriate credit. That said, let's get started with our imports. So as always, we need the base package torch. We need torch.nn as nn, that is for our layers. We need nn.functional to handle functional activations such as ReLU. And of course, Optim to handle our optimizers. We also need the uh, Torch Vision data sets. And we're going to stick with the nmist example. Now, of course, it's very boring, but it is tried and true and gives us a handy baseline for comparison with the other two videos in which we did a simple neural network and a kind of uh, extensive convolutional neural network, but written out line by line. So it's kind of, you know, not so pretty looking. We also need uh, Torch Vision transforms. We will need to tensor. This is necessary to turn the uh, raw data into a tensor for handling in PyTorch. Of course, we need NumPy to handle NumPy type operations. And we will need um, at plotlib.pyplot to handle plotting of our learning curve. So if you recall the last example, we had a long class with, I don't know, 30, 40 lines of layers, very messy, very easy to make a mistake, worst of all, and not very extensible. If you wanna change up the design of your convolutional neural network, then you're basically gonna to have to uh, cross your fingers and hope you don't make a mistake. But that isn't the best way to do things. We have an option here, and that is using a modular approach. So we define a base class called CNN cell. And of course, as always with PyTorch, that derives from nn.module so that we get access to the self.parameters function. We'll need to define our initializer, of course, which will require some input channels and output channels. And of course, whenever you derive a class from another class, you wanna call the super constructor. And now we can handle the really good stuff. So. We define a convolutional layer as a conv2d layer in channels equals input channels and kernel size equals three. That is going to trigger my OCD. Uh, we also need a variable for output channels and you know what? Uh, yeah, let's call it out. Yeah, output channels. And that is it for the conv. It's just a basic convolutional neural network. We need the batch norm layer, and that's nn.batchNorm2d equals output channels. Now keep in mind that since we're using batch norm2d, this is gonna require that we set the neural network into evaluation mode later so that it doesn't further collect statistics when we handle testing of our CNN. Just a little detail to keep track of. And we need a ReLU layer, which is of course nn.ReLU. Uh, now we need the forward pass function. And that takes in uh, batch size, or sorry, batch data as input, the data we want to feed forward. Output equals self.conv batch data. And output equals self.bn batch data. And output self.ReLU. Output, sorry, this should be output, of course. And there we go. And return output. So that is our base CNN cell. And so this allows us to build networks of arbitrary complexity like so. So we'll say class CNN network, that's convolutional neural network, not CNN. CNN module, uh, def init, self learning rate, batch size and classes and epochs uh, super self no sorry CNN network and uh, self dot init 
So self.learning rate equals learning rate. We want to save all of our variables as appropriate. Batch size, batch size, and classes. Self.epochs. This is, of course, the number of epochs we're going to train our model for. Next thing we have to worry about is the device. So if you have a GPU, it is incredibly important to take advantage of that. If you don't, this will work on a CPU because the MNIST data set is quite small. So it's not going to break the bank on the CPU, so to speak. But the way you handle that is you call torch.device, uh, not CUDA, CUDA zero if t.cuda is available else CPU. So what this will do is it will check to see if your uh, GPU zero is available. If you have two GPUs, you can specify CUDA one. And then what you can do is use arg parse to handle command line parsing and pass in a variable to send it to either CUDA zero or CUDA one, depending on if you want to train multiple models on different GPUs. In this case, I do have two GPUs, but we're going to stick it on just the first one. And if that GPU is not available, then it's going to stick it on the CPU. We're also going to need a loss history. That's just a list to keep track of your losses for plotting later to see if it is learning. And of course, the other parameter of interest is the accuracy over time. Now we get to the fun part of defining our network. So previously, what we had to do was uh, write out a whole bunch of these layers over and over and over again, and it was quite ugly. But now, since we have an actual class to handle all that, all we have to do is say self.cell1 equals CNN cell input channels equals one. And this is because the MNIST data set is a grayscale image, so it only has one channel. Output channels, and in this case, the channels, uh, a little bit confusing nomenclature, but a channel here is the number of filters for your convolutional neural network. So self.cell2 is another CNN cell. Input channels equal 32. Output channels equal 32. And of course, since we're going to be passing in the output from cell one, uh, cell two will take 32 channels as input, and of course, output 32 as well. Just we're copying the uh, the parameters from our previous video. Channels equal 32. Output channels equal 32. So as is typical, we're going to add in a max pooling layer. Max pool one equals nn dot max pool 2D kernel size equals two. So this will do a two by two max pulling over our images. And then we can proceed with our new layers. You know what, let's be lazy and do a copy paste because why not? And then be sure to change the names five and six. So then we take 32 channels as input, 64 as output, and then for the next cell, we want 64 and uh, 64, 64 output and 64 input. Okay, I don't think I made any mistakes. Self.max pool 2 equals nn.max pool 2d size equals 2. Now, this may still look like a lot of code, but keep in mind that each of these cells is, uh, what is that, five lines? One, two, three, four, five lines, yeah, so can I count? Yes, five lines of code, so you are compressing five lines into one. That's not too bad. I'll take that any day of the week and twice on Sundays. So next, we need to construct all this into a network. Network equals nn.sequential. So nn.sequential just builds a sequential model on a series of layers. Uh, self.cell1, self.cell2, cell3, cell4, 5, 6, and I forgot <clears throat> the max pool 1. Very important, don't want to forget the max pooling. Let's go ahead and tidy up a little bit. Cell six, self.max pool two. I believe that is it. So that is our network. And of course, with every convolutional neural network, you want to follow your CNN layers with a fully connected layer to handle the classification. And that is nn.linear in features equals 256 out 
features equals n classes. Now the in features two equals 256. This was done by trial and error. Uh, just I know the output from the final layers will be 256 channels. Or sorry, 256 features. And so uh, if you want this to be a little bit more modular, a little bit more professional looking, you would use a function to calculate the number of features by doing a feed forward of some dummy data through the network and calculating the number of uh, number of features or neurons that come out. Just a way to improve upon the code, fork this, improve it, make it your own. So self.loss equals nn.cross entropy loss. Now the cross entropy loss is employed whenever you want to handle multi-class classification. If you only have two classes, it's binary uh, cross entropy loss, I believe is the nomenclature. Uh, for multi-class classification, it's cross entropy loss. Self.optimizer, optim.atom, self.parameters, lr equals self.running rate. And very important, uh, you want to send your entire network to the device to make sure you're using CUDA tensors. And finally, we want a function to get data. Uh, this will be identical to the other, other, uh, other examples we've done, so that there should be nothing new there. Next thing we want to handle is the feed forward function for our network. And that takes batch data as input. And you want to be careful here. Uh, t.tensor batch data.2 self.device. Uh, we have to be careful because we don't want to pass in a NumPy array because PyTorch is quite particular about the data you pass in. And you want to be extra careful to send it to your device because the network lives on the device, so it's going to be expecting CUDA tensors. And so you have to pass in CUDA tensors. Otherwise, it's going to give you, you know, uh, an error. Equals self.network batch data. And output equals output dot view minus one that's the batch dimension and 256 and output equals self dot fully connected output return output so that's the feed forward function it just uh, sticks the data onto the uh, the device passes it for the network which is defined by the sequential function flattens it and then passes it through the fully connected layer um, other thing to note here is that the a uh, fully, connect fully connected layer does not have an activation function, and that's because the cross entropy loss will perform its own softmax activation. Uh, so that way the sum of the probabilities is one, where the probability me means the probability of the instance belonging to one of the classes. <clears throat> Next, we have a function to get the data, and the purpose of this is just to load the data and to create the data loader objects. MNIST train data equals MNIST. Uh, that will live in a directory called mnist train equals true download equals true and transform equals to tensor so this will stick it in a directory called mnist forward slash and this is relative indexing so this isn't uh, the root on your file directory train equals true is necessary because you will occasionally want to test your data and in which case you would have train equals false that's how it knows whether or not you are in training or testing mode for the particular data set then you have download equals true that's so that uh, pytorch can download the data if it doesn't have it already in this directory and of course the two tensor transform handles turning the raw data into pytorch tensors which is quite important now that I think about it, what makes me pause is, do we need this in conjunction with this? Uh, good question, and I don't know. We might be able to get away with saying batch data equals batch data dot two. Uh, that's something to experiment with on your own. Uh, so yeah, I'm not entirely certain, but I'm doing it this way to be especially careful about how I declare my data types. So we need a train data loader equals t.utils.data.data dot data loader. And this is an object that is basically an iterator. Uh, a generator returns uh, an object that you can iterate over to get the next batch of data in your data set. And of course, the first parameter is the data you want to iterate over. And batch size equals self.batch size. Shuffle equals true. Num workers equals eight. So of course, you always want to shuffle your data and num workers is just the number of uh, threads to devote to the task. So that is for our training data. 
And let's go ahead and copy that for our test data, being especially careful to train, uh, turn this to train instead of, sorry, to test instead of train. I can't type and talk at the same time. Test data loader and this test data. And you still want to shuffle. Yeah, that is correct. Okay, perfect. So that is it for our get data function. The next thing we have to handle is the actual functionality to train our agent. So def, not agent, sorry, to train our network. I'm in uh, reinforcement learning mode. So uh, the first thing you want to call is self.train. And now we haven't defined this function. This function exists because we are deriving from the nn.module base class. What this does is it tells PyTorch that we are in training mode and so we want to collect batch statistics for the batch norm 2D function. When we do tr uh, testing, we're gonna call self. I think it's eval, I'll have to look at my documentation. Self.eval to let it know we're in training mode or testing mode and don't wanna collect batch statistics for the batch norm 2D function. An important distinction. And if we didn't have batch norm 2D, it wouldn't be an issue, we wouldn't need that. I in range self dot epochs episode loss equals zero. We just want to keep track of the loss over the episode or J and the tuple input and label in enumerate self dot train data loader. So this will call the train data loader generator and iterate over it uh, with the enumerate and it'll give you an index as well as an input and label. Self.optimizer.0 grad. Nothing mysterious here. Uh, if you've done a lot of work in PyTorch, you know that PyTorch accumulates gradients between steps of the training. And so you want to zero those out each time so that you don't get accumulation of gradients. We also have to send our label uh, to the device, label.2 self.device prediction equals self.forward input classes equals t to argmax prediction dim equals one. What I'm doing here is I'm getting the the classes. Uh, remember this isn't activated so it's not really giving you probabilities. The probabilities are just a scale factor effectively and we're doing a we're getting the classes which is the uh, maximum dimension along the predictions along the class dimension not the batch dimension. The reason I want to do that is because I want to know how many we're getting wrong so I can calculate my accuracy dot where classes not equal to label and the uh, syntax here with PyTorch where function is uh, where this is true we want to assign it this value t dot tensor one uh, dot two self dot device and where it is false we want to pass it a value assign it a value of zero. And the reason is we want to sum up the number of wrong, not correct. So accuracy equals one minus t dot sum wrong divided by self dot batch size. So it's going to scale by the batch size because we're summing over the batch. Loss uh, equals self dot loss prediction and label. So this will calculate the loss based on our predictions and the labels. History dot append act.item. What we want to do here is we want to append our accuracy to the list. And since accuracy is a tensor, we don't really care about the tensor. We care about the value contained within the tensor. So we have to call accuracy.item. And episode loss plus equals loss.item. Same logic here. Loss is a tensor. We want the value. Then we say loss.backward. That will backpropagate our loss. And self.optimizer dot step and so that'll step our atom optimizer very important you won't get learning if you neglect to include these two steps ask me how I know then you want to have a little print statement to say you finished epoch I total loss uh, formatted 3.f percent episode loss and self dot loss history dot append episode loss that's it for the uh, training function. Very, very straightforward. It's just a loop over epochs and a loop over your data set. Zero the gradient, get your labels, make your predictions, find out where you're wrong, calculate your loss, and step your optimizer. Very straightforward. Next thing we have to do is the testing function, def test self 
So I'm going to use my cheat sheet here. Most of it is very, very similar. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is say self dot eval. And then I can take this stuff and copy it for the most part. Now we aren't going to iterate over epochs. So epoch loss is kind of a uh, weird quantity here, but we'll leave it and say episode accuracy equals an empty list. Um, do I have accuracy? No, I do not. Okay, so next, instead of enumerating over the train data loader, we want to enumerate over the test data loader. We don't need to zero the gradients because we're not actually doing any learning, so that doesn't make any sense. We do need our labels, our predictions, our classes, our where statement. We need the accuracy. We don't need the loss. Um, no, what we do, what we don't need is that. There we go. Episode loss plus equals loss dot item. And we want to say total loss. Let's just do this. Say total loss percent dot 3F um, accuracy percent dot 3F. I have one too many apostrophes here, percent, we want to pass in EP loss and NumPy mean episode accuracy. Uh, kind of a misnomer, I don't really like that, but we'll get rid of this. Next we have our main function to test everything, name equals main, network equals CNN network learning rate, 0 0.001 batch size 32. You can play around with the batch size. The data is pretty small, so you can get away with a larger batch size. Uh, but you'll need to change the 256 I have hard coded earlier. Just kind of a nuisance. 25 epochs and 10 classes because we're classifying digits 0 through 9. Network dot train and plt dot plot network dot loss history plt.show, plt.plotnetwork.accuracy history, and plt.show, and then PL, um, sorry, network dot underscore test. All right, fingers crossed. Let's head to the terminal and see how many typos I made. All right, let's give it a shot. Okay, init got an unexpected keyword argument out put channels. So that is in line 15 in our initializer. Okay, we're just going to use nano rather than going back to the uh, other uh, code editor. So we'll say nano plus, I think that's the syntax, plus 15. We're going to find out. Okay, line 15. So output channels, it's probably out channels since it's in channels up here. Try it again. Uh, same issue in line 16. Okay. Uh, line 16. Output channels is not defined. Uh, num features equals output channels. Have I misspelled something? Am I stroking out? says line 16 self output channels is not defined oh it's oh you put that's why <laughs> I am stroking out all right that's the downside of nano uh well you that's because it's okay so that's line 17 that's because the L is capitalized okay well you Torch shot and has no oh <laughs> uh, you know PyTorch annoys me sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's inconsistent okay so now it's doing something let's see what it's doing okay it's downloading my data set because apparently I don't have it downloaded already so then it's going to uh, move from downloading into training so I'll go ahead and wait here and I'll cut back when it's done okay it is done and it is giving me a 
a, a little error there or a warning. I'm not going to worry about that for now. And it says, not all arguments converted during string formatting. Oh, that's because I have a dollar sign. Okay, I can see that, line 101. That's because I have a dollar sign instead of a percent. Try it again. And of course, it should go much quicker this time because I already have the data downloaded. Okay, so we finished Epoch Zero, so let me do something. Let's open another terminal window and see, verify it's running on our GPU. And yeah, indeed, I can see it right here. It's running on GPU Zero precisely as I told it. Uh, and it is only taking 879 megabytes. Very nice, very nice. So it is training. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video here and come back when it is done. Other thing to note really quick while it's training is the GPU utilization. So whereas it does use a little under a gigabyte of VRAM, it only uses 32% of the volatile uh, the utilization. So it's really not really stressing the GPU. Uh, right now it's basically CPU bound because it's doing a lot of the transformations on the CPU. So even if you have a beefy GPU, you can see, you know, I'm running a 2080 Ti here, two of them in fact. It's only running on one of them, but it is not really stressing the GPU. So uh, kind of a waste in this situation. And checking in with the loss, you can see that the loss is steadily going down over time. This is a good sign it's telling you it's learning. If you don't see this with a simple classification problem, if you don't see it decreasing relatively steadily over time, then you have a problem you want to stop and go ahead and take a look at either your network, your learning rate, your data, stuff like that to make sure you haven't made some type of silly error along the way. Okay, so it has finished running, and you can see the plots here. They show that the um, agent has decrease its loss over time and increased its accuracy over time, approaching something like 99% accuracy. Uh, I suppose I could have pl uh, printed out the accuracy here to make it a little bit better, uh, but we do have one issue. The accuracy in the testing phase is NAND. So let's head back to the code editor and see where I made a mistake there. Okay, so looking at the code, uh, we're calculating NP mean episode accuracy. So here's our list defined there. So Okay, so then we have, um, uh, let's see, where is it, EP loss? I don't have an episode accuracy. That's probably why it is wonky. So what I wanted to do is this, self.episode accuracy dot append uh, accuracy dot item. Okay, perfect. So that will probably fix it. Famous last words, of course. Uh, other thing I want to do is, you know, I want to come up here and say, instead of just this, I want to say total loss uh, training accuracy. And then we will do this episode loss, comma, ac dot item. Uh, is that correct? No, it is NP. It's the same thing here, NP mean. Sorry, MP, that's just, if I do act.item, it'll be the accuracy for the last batch, which is not what we want, MP mean, and that is um, episode accuracy, which I have not self dot, I have not defined. So we need that up here, episode loss, episode accuracy equals empty list. Uh, yeah, at the top of every epoch, and then episode loss, we can do this, episode accuracy dot append um, act dot item. Is that correct? I believe it is. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the terminal, run it again, and make sure it's printing out what I expected to print out, and so we get a final resolution to this with something that looks reasonable. And plot twist, what is going on here? It says, what have I done? I've fixed this. Oh. <laughs> I know what happened. So uh, I didn't reload the file in the code editor. So, man, that's a pain in the rear. Let's go back to the code editor and just fix that stuff all there because we know what it is. Man, what a pain. This is the danger of using Nano and keeping the code editor open at the same time. 
So as I recall, it was lines 15, 16, and 17. We had out channels, num features equals output channels. It is rel u. And was there one other? I'm trying to think. Um, oh yeah, I had the dollar sign instead of the percent sign right here. Okay. Yeah, that's the danger of using two different things. Oh man, I should just use Vim and call it a day, whatever. All right, so let's go back to the terminal and hope and pray it works correctly. All right, keep my fingers crossed. So of course it should, you know, it, it, that doesn't change the fact that we've downloaded the data, so it should get started right away, which it looks to be doing. Not all arguments converted during string formatting. Interesting. That is on line 104 in train. Oh, that, okay. That's obvious. So let's go back to the code editor rather than making another silly mistake. So that is right here. Percent dot three F. There we go. So that should work. And I was doing so well, I had like two videos in a row where I didn't have any typos. Oh well, can't win them all, I guess. There we go. So, perfect. So, loss is high, accuracy is still pretty decent for the first epoch. This thing learns really fast, evidently. A little skeptical, actually. All right, let's see. Okay, it goes from 97.3 to 98.8, as we would expect. So I'm going to let that run, and then we will see the testing accuracy so we can see if we have a little bit of overtraining or not. And, of course, I did make a typo at the end, but you can see the training accuracy was 0.999. Uh, so the error comes in in line uh, 1... 21 in the test function. Uh, okay, let's go back to the code editor and see what's up. So it said line 121. Okay, so our uh, CNN network does not have something called uh, its accuracy history. Okay, that's what we call that. So then if we come down here in line 121, it is unhappy self dot episode accuracy does not self.episode accuracy. Okay. Uh, I wish I'd caught that sooner. That's a pain in the neck. So let's head back to the terminal and run it again. Oh, before we do, I'm going to set this to run for 10 epochs just to save time because uh, we already saw that it goes to 99.9 .9, uh, plus some decimal places uh, with training after 25 epochs. So let's just leave it there and see what we get. So it has finished and you can see that we again get 99.7 percent accuracy on our training data, but only 99.3 on our testing data. This is pretty normal. It's called overtraining. And the way you deal with this is by adding dropout to your network. It happens because we have too many parameters. We have more parameters than we really need to describe our problem. And so it ends up not doing as well on the testing data. So you add dropout that gets rid of some of the uh, parameters and boom, you'll get a better performance on testing data. So I hope this has been helpful. Make sure to share if it is. Leave a comment, question, subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to hit that bell icon because I know only 14% of you are getting my notifications and I'll see you in the next video.